extreme. So, uh, you know, those who mobilize nationalism, military power, uh, economic power, uh, privilege and knowledge, I mean, these are all sort of sources of, of power within the system. Um, uh, it seems to me, in the same way as Wikipedia uh, is, so to speak, contaminated by you know, the struggle for power, it's meant to be a democratic process. Um, how to ensure that there is not intimidation, there is not corruption, there is not threat uh, as we move towards individual sovereignty? You can't be confused by a desire for protection, perfection, which is not attainable. First off, so let's put that aside. We're dealing with human beings. No better, no worse than what we have right now. Now, like that lady over there, you just articulated your knowledge of the negatives of representative government, and you have applied them to this new process of governance that you have no experience in, nor do I. I've just studied it more. So, so now, but I go back to the premise. You have two alternatives. Stay with what you got, or venture out into something new and not so new because I don't know about Canada, but I would say that the majority of American citizens have already been lawmakers. When you vote for or against a bond issue in your community, that's lawmaking. And that's important lawmaking because you're indebting yourself as a community, whether it's local government, state government, or federal government. And so the people at the local and state have been exercising that power, and in a very imperfect way. And it hasn't caused an unbelievable tragedy. In the United States, with the various states that have had initiatives, uh, maybe less than 10%, 5% have been, by my criteria, bad initiatives. And they passed, and then they were changed, or keep in mind, now, when the people pass an initiative, it still has to be adjudicated to be constitutional, unless they can amend the Constitution, and under my process, they can amend the Constitution. When the people, and this is very critical, when the people come into power as lawmakers in partnership with their elected officials, they are the senior partners, automatically, because they are the sovereigns. Officialdom of government are not the sovereigns. So if you pass the law, and let's say uh, the special interest by the Congress, and they change the law, the people pass it, the Congress changes it. Well, the people will change it back again. And the Congress may change it back again. But the next time, you'll see an amendment to the Constitution doing away with the Congress. And politicians are not that dumb. Politicians will turn around and take the whiff of which is the proper direction for me to go in, to be popular with the people, and that is to turn around and defer to the people. So what you'll see is a win-win situation. This is my projection. You'll see that the people in representative government will reach down, the legislators now, not the executives, they'll reach down into the body of the bureaucracy, pull back all that power that they've been pushing down there because they don't want to bother with it. And then they'll start using that on a day-to-day -day basis to do a more representative job in the minutia of governance. And then the people will set the policy. And so now, when you say, well, they, oh, the corporations are gonna uh, sabotage the people. They can't, they, they really can't. I gave you the example, and you'd have to read the details of the law, you know, the, the procedures that are followed. Uh, and, and something very fundamental that you probably wouldn't think of unless you were a legislator. How do you set up the, the continuity of legislation. Well, in a legislative body, the majority does that. They decide, well, that bill's gonna get up for a vote, this one doesn't, we don't like that bill. So the Democrats scuttle Republicans, and the Republicans, when they're in power, do the same thing, and you do the same thing in your own parliament, okay? But that's not the way this happens. And it took me two, three days to thinking on this, well, I, because I had legislative experience. How the hell are we going to set up a continuity of the legislation? You know how simple it is? Chronologically. So when you come in with an initiative, you're first, you come in, you're second, he's third, 
and then we deal with it on a chronological basis. And so if your initiative you pass, he changes it, you say, what's the law? The last initiative to pass. The, the last law is the law. So you see, you have a whole bunch of those dynamics that play into there that will be so disruptive to the understanding of, of corporate America. They don't understand this. You take the oil companies, you know, they're great in, in drilling holes. In fact, I was horrified when I heard that Obama's gonna take over the, the, the leak problem in Louisiana, oh my God. What we don't need is the government. We need the government to supervise and to regulate, but we don't need the government to run what the oil industry has done in a very scientific kind of way. But but this is the way politicians act. You got to take it over, you know, so that I can be a hero when the solution uh, comes up. But but I hope I've answered your question. But you you've got something a little more fundamental than you realize, and that is. What would stop, and I get this question sometimes, what would stop a, the people voting discrimination? What would stop the people voting slavery? You know, if you got the military force, let's go do it. Well, it's very simple. What would stop it? There's no way to stop it. You see, you have to rely on the moral judgment of the people. Now, the reason why I said that only two-thirds of the uh, G20 countries that this could apply. Well, later on it'll apply to Africa. But right now, they're not mature enough. They don't have the institutions. And it's so silly to think because you have a vote, like in Iraq, that you got a democracy. That's the stupidest thing in the world. And you think that you're gonna get a democracy in Afghanistan without the institutions and the education level to bring this up? Of course not. But that's what our policies are. You're a representative of government, we're spending zillions of dollars on something that won't work, and any rational analysis of it will show you that it doesn't work. Please. What's your view of the proposition that you probably in your 10% you don't approve of, like the, uh, the tax restrictions in California and um, the one in, uh, in Switzerland to prevent the uh, building of mosques? It's a majority decision. It's, and, and is it so bad? First off, uh, you may not be aware, or you, maybe you are, that the Swiss voted immigration. Those, this was a very, this was a real test. Are they gonna let these people, the Turks and the others that were coming in to work their economy, are they gonna let them become citizens? The Swiss in a majority voted to let them become citizens of Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. So you're quite right. Now is that any different, the Swiss, uh, <coughs> talking about mosques, what about Sarkozy with the bail? I mean, these are human questions. I, I think it's ridiculous for women to walk around with a scarf on their head all the time or to wear the burqa. I mean, women are beautiful. I mean, this is something to be admired. The only good thing God did for us is to give us women. <laughs> so, so now, you know, and, and you get a religion that hides women, the pulchritude of women. I mean, it's, to me, that's so, but that's just my view. And, but I'm not empowering me. I'm not saying vote for me to be the world dictator. I'm saying vote for the people of the world to dictate the policies they want to live under at the state, local, and national, and global level. So, so in terms of the California taxation limitation, I mean, what you were getting is... Oh, well, I'll, I'll talk about that. Oh, okay. The taxation, that's, uh, that's the proposition 13. Yeah, that's right. Okay, which started the new revolution of initiatives. Well, first off, you have to understand that Prop 13 was addressing a problem that was very injurious to the elderly. Those, your tax, the value of your property was rising, the politicians were taxing it on a, a rising level, and you had the same house, but you're now paying more taxes. And if you're my age, and, you're, and you got a house, and, and you're paying more taxes that you can't afford, you gotta sell the house. Where am I gonna live? And so, they had been, the, the elderly, the senior citizens were addressing that to the liberal democratic leadership in Sacramento of California, and they did not touch it for 10 years. They, they had the horn, of, and this is what politicians, the horn of cornucopia, all this money coming in, they could do what they wanted with it, and, uh, and, the, and, and 
the people got no certainty. So along came Jarvis and Gap, two unsophisticated legislators, cause people. They said, we're going to give some relief. So what they did is they took a, a butcher knife and they created a piece of legislation that should have been designed more <coughs> properly, more surgically. But the politicians weren't touching it. So what prevailed is the people revolted and voted for Prop 13. Now, what was interesting, that right after Prop 13 came a piece of legislation that guaranteed that 40% of the budget went for education in the state of California. May I add to that? Yes. It goes back, I grew up in Van Nuys, California, riding the Pacific Electric, the big red car, cost a nickel. It was the largest public transportation system in the world. In fact, it's featured in the film, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. In the film, the good guys win. You walk out of the theater and you see all the cement, asphalt, <coughs> parking lots, because the uh, General Motors, uh, Firestone, rubber, I forget, some other company. They came in here, they bought up the company, and they destroyed it. So that we would have to buy their products in order to get around in a city as spread out as Los Angeles is. And then they went to Congress and lobby. So like when you're building freeways, I remember the signs. 91%, 93% support built by the federal government. Then you had FHA that would give you subsidies to move into the suburbs and buy a house rather than living in an apartment in the city. Plus, or you can deduct your mortgage, you know, all kinds of things. It's not just that Los Angeles grew up after the age of the automobile. No, it was very subsidized and directed. So it didn't happen by itself. We did a program on this, and a transportation economist estimated that at the time, it was about 15 years ago, that taxpayers, like especially property owners, were subsidizing motorists like about $2,900 per year per motorist through the highways, through the courts, through the motorcycle policemen, through the bailiffs, all these other things, all these other ancillary costs. And, and they're dumping that on the property owners. And that led to the revolt, but led to a revolt without understanding the underlying causes of the problem. Yeah, excuse me. And that's the difference between, just one, one addendum. That's the difference between a, a law where you have a process. It's deliberative legislation. So it's not just, oh, there's a problem, we solve it. It doesn't work that way. You have hearings, you bring in experts. There's an analytical process and a communications process to this whole thing. And that's, and that's why I was answering, the devil is in the details. If you have good details, you have a good tool, and the, the, the good fortune is, uh, I was able, with a number of people, to write this law over a seven year period. Trial and error, figuring out. And we didn't have to compromise with anybody. We just did what we, and, and it, it will have flaws, but we leave enough room in this for the people subsequently to improve upon the better legislation. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Senator Mike. <laughs> for another hour, yeah. another three hours. I, I think we can just stretch our legs, etc. because in uh, less than uh, seven minutes, uh, Dr. Rhodes actually is chairing the other session. Oh, am I? Am I? Okay. <laughs> no, that's fine, I'll do it. <laughs> I thought I was chairing the session. Oh, sorry, Eric. And you're presenting.